truth in its essence is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. When truth is called a lie, the lights go out, darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is dark, how very deep will the darkness be? All the words in this book can be compressed into one word, the eternal word, Jesus the Christ. In many and various ways, God spoke of old to our Father by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. God, our Father, so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. In the last two classes, we spoke about God's revelation. Now we're going to speak about man's response to that loving revelation of God. The response is called faith. Faith is a word which is much used and sometimes even abused. And so a good understanding of faith is necessary. <clears throat> the Catechism provides that for us. Scripture tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, if that's the case, and I believe the word of God, I want to know all about faith because I do want to please God and I know you do too. And so we're going to look into this great mystery of faith. Great is the mystery of faith. The Catechism teaches us in number 142, where I'm going to be beginning for those who are following along, by his revelation, the invisible God from the fullness of his love addresses men as his friends and moves among them in order to invite and receive them into his own company. The adequate response to this invitation is faith. What a beautiful gift faith is. Many of us have had that gift since the day we were baptized. I was baptized when I was 10 days old, and it is an infused gift theological virtue, faith, hope, charity. Those are the three theological virtues. Faith basically is to think and to act with a sense, the obedience of faith. Faith really is to posit an act of obedience. By faith, man completely submits his intellect and his will to God. With his whole being, man gives his assent to God, the revealer. Sacred scripture calls this human response to God, the author of revelation, the obedience of faith. We hear the word of God. God reveals himself to us in the person of his only son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Our response to that revelation is the obedience of faith. That word obedience, to obey, comes from a Latin verb, obaudere, to hear or listen to. To hear or listen to in faith is to submit freely to the word that has been heard. And the, and the reason we do this is because it's truth. The truth of that word we have heard is guaranteed by God, who is truth itself. Now, one of the rather common misconceptions is that we believe what we can understand. That's not faith. That's seeing it. 
Now, I'm going to go into this in a little more detail, but we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, that does not mean that we shouldn't seek understanding. We must seek understanding. God's given us an intellect, and it's oriented towards truth. And so we should seek understanding. But there is no opposition between faith and reason. But faith and reason are not the same thing. The problem with reason is that it often quickly becomes unreasonable. Our mind is finite because we are creatures. God is the only one who is infinite. Our finite man, mind is not fully capacitated to encompass, to embrace the infinite God. We can understand what he reveals to us, and that's all. But it doesn't mean there's opposition or contradiction between faith and reason, no. But we walk by faith, not by sight. First, give the obedience of faith, the assent of faith. Why should I do that? Because of the one who reveals himself to me. His name is truth. He is absolute truth. He can neither deceive nor be deceived. And so I accept his revelation based on him, the one who reveals it to me. He's trustworthy. He's trustworthy. Believe me, you can trust God. You can't trust me, and you can't trust anybody else, but you can trust God. He's truthful. He's faithful. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. He's the truth itself, and that's why we give him the obedience of faith. <coughs> Abraham is called the father of all who believe. The letter to the Hebrews in its great eulogy of the faith of Israel's ancestors lays a special emphasis on the faith of Abraham. You remember what happened to Abraham. He became the father of many nations. He went to a place that he, he didn't even know where he was going. God gave him a promise. And Abraham walked in faith. In a sense, he walked in darkness. He didn't know how that, that promise would unfold. But he believed. He didn't know where he was to go. He lived in a stra as a stranger and a pilgrim in a foreign land. God even then asked him to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. What did he do? Did he question God? He did not. He acted in faith, trusting that God is God, that God knows what he's doing, laying down a principle and a rule for all of us who believe, even when it seems like it doesn't make any sense. And you and I both know sometimes certain things don't seem to make any sense. God is God. You trust him. He's got it all worked out. God doesn't have to figure it out. He's figured it out from all eternity. All we have to do is accept his wisdom. And believe me, his wisdom is as far above ours as the heavens are above the earth, as scripture tells us. Our Blessed Mother is the perfect embodiment of this faith that we're talking about. That faith, which the letter to the Hebrews once again tells us, that faith, which is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Abraham believed God, and it was right, reckoned to him as righteousness. Our Blessed Mother believed God, too. Remember what happened at the Annunciation. The angel Gabriel announced to her, that she would conceive and give birth to one who would be called the Son of God. <clears throat> Our Lady did not understand all of this. She was a little Jewish girl waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And although she didn't understand it perfectly, she said, yes, fiat, mi secundum verbum tuum, be it done unto me according to thy word. That's faith. Even though I don't understand it all, God, I accept your will, be it done unto me, according to thy word. You know, as we go through this teaching this year, I want you to make this a continuing spiritual exercise. This is not mere head learning. You know, we have to learn. The intellectual part is very important. 
But if it stops there, it's not enough. We have to interiorize it. We have to make it part of ourselves, part of our own life, our own mission. And when we do that, then we become who we are called to be. We actualize our full human and Christian potential to be Jesus Christ, the one who's not only true God, but truly human as well. And so Our Lady is the perfect personification of this faith. From the first moment of the Annunciation and the Incarnation, all the way through her son's life, to the pain, the abnegation, the suffering of the cross, she remained faithful. Sabbat Mater, the Lenten hymn begins, she stood at the foot of the cross, faithful, faithful. Everybody else deserted Jesus, but his mother and a few of the good women, St. John, remained faithful at the foot of the cross. They were not concerned about the disgrace of it. They were not going to abandon Jesus when the hour of evil had come. They remained faithful right to the end. Our Lady is the perfect personification of this great gift of faith. The Catechism, reflecting the teaching of the Church throughout the ages, teaches us that we are to have absolute faith in God alone. You do not put your faith in me. You do not put your faith in any human being. You put your faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I can bring Jesus to you, just as you can bring Jesus to me and to other people. We are instruments, we are vehicles that transport the good God into the hearts and minds of other people. But the one we believe in is God Almighty. Because I'll tell you something, you're setting yourself up for a great disappointment if you put your faith in a man or a woman. That's weak and foul. We're, we're human. We're creatures. We're finite. Our virtue is limited. But God will never fail. And so the Catechism teaches us, put your faith in God. God alone. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He will never let you down. Everybody else might let you down. God will never let you down. He is faithful. He is true. Because, quite simply, he is truth itself. Truth personified. Definitions are very helpful. There's a principle that I want you to be aware of. I don't want you to ever fall into the trap of allowing apparent contradictions to be set up in your mind. There is no contradiction between knowledge of God and love of God. To know him is to love him. As you love him, you'll want to know him. There's an interconnection. Never fall for that tired old error that head knowledge, that study of the faith isn't really important. Never fall for that terrible yet subtle error, it's a heresy really, that would have you believe what is important is faith, not the faith. Anyone who makes a statement like that doesn't understand either faith or the faith. If you have faith, what is your faith in? Your faith is in God, right. Definitions are important. You need to memorize certain things. Memorizing certain things doesn't diminish our nobility as human persons. It helps to enhance our nobility, helps us to come into the fullness of our nobility as children of God. You need to remember certain things. Can you imagine if an engineer or a physicist said, I don't want to remember formulas. Formulas are not important. The bridge would soon collapse. You have to remember certain things. A doctor, a lawyer, an accountant. I don't care what it is. We all have to remember certain basic things about whatever it is that we're involved with. It's common sense. So it is with the faith. Now let me give you the church's definition of the theological virtue of faith. Number 1814. 
in the Catechism. Faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God and believe all that God has said and revealed to us and that Holy Church proposes for our belief because he is truth itself. By faith, man freely commits his entire self to God. For this reason, the believer seeks to know and to do God's will. The righteous shall live by faith, and living faith works through charity. Now let's just look at that definition for a moment. A lot of times there are subtle deficiencies in people's understanding. If you ask most people, do you have faith, brother? They'll say, oh yes, I believe. Well, amen. I'm glad you believe. What do you believe? Well, I believe in God. Good. But do you understand what it means to say, I believe, we believe in God? If you believe in God, then you believe what he has revealed and said. Belief in God and belief in his revelation are inextricably one. You can't take one and reject the other. That is a very subtle error. If you believe in God, then do what he said. If we believe in God, then accept his revelation. And in order to do that, of course, we have to accept the church's teaching. There is no separation between Christ and his mystical body, the church. And you cannot bracket out church teaching, especially that part of it that you find uncomfortable, and yet say, I believe. Because underneath that statement, I believe, you have put up certain roadblocks. I believe, but I don't really believe this or that or the other thing. It doesn't work that way. To believe, to have faith means, yes, you believe in God. Is that enough? No. Satan believes in the existence of God. He's seen him face to face. To believe in the existence of God is a, is a beginning, but it's not the end. To believe in God, to believe everything that God has said and revealed to us. How can you believe it if you don't know what it is? You have to hear it first. How are you going to hear it? You listen to your mother, the church, and your mother tells you all about Jesus. That's the faith. You obey, then, what you have heard, the obedience of faith. So to believe in God, to believe everything God has said and revealed, and to believe everything Holy Church proposes for our belief. That last one often trips people up. It doesn't say to believe part of what Holy Church proposes for our belief. Now, I know that's hard sometimes. And I sympathize. I really do. You might not think I do, but I really sympathize with anyone who struggles with this or that teaching of the church. I sympathize with it, but only to a certain point. A thousand doubts, or I should say a thousand difficulties, don't make a single doubt. An old saying from the fathers. A thousand difficulties don't make a single doubt. Don't doubt the teaching of Christ. Don't doubt the teaching of the church. There are many difficulties. Why are there difficulties? Because our mind is limited and doesn't have a full capacity to apprehend the fullness of truth. If it did, we'd be God. If we had a mind that were infinite, we'd be God. Well, what are we trying to understand? We're trying to understand God. By definition, he's infinite. And so our capacity for understanding the fullness of the revelation of God is limited. And so it is no wonder that we struggle with this or that teaching of the church. But you must trust we do not accept church teaching because it is plausible. That is a ridiculous error. We do not accept church teaching because it sounds good. We accept it because God himself has revealed it. And I trust him. 
I trust that he knows what he's doing. His revelation has come to me through my good and holy mother, the Catholic Church. I believe it. Do I understand it all? I do not understand it all perfectly. And neither do you. And neither did the greatest saints and doctors of the church who ever lived. We understand what we're able to. And the rest, we accept on faith. We walk by, by faith, not by sight. But once again, do not think that you just then say, well, I don't need my mind then. I just blindly go along with what the church teaches. No, we have a mind, and it's made for truth. And we are to use our mind to come into greater understanding of that truth. But faith precedes understanding. St. Anselm laid down one of the great principles for all theological reflection, fides quarens intellectum. Faith precedes understanding. Faith opens the portals for the light to flood in. St. Augustine said, I believe that I might better understand, and I understand that I might better believe. As you come into a greater understanding of this mystery we call our faith, your appreciation will increase. Your faith will be solidified and mature. But walk by faith first. Say yes to God. Lord, I do not understand it all, but I believe it all. I have five university degrees, including a doctorate in theology. But you know what? There is very little that I understand about God, because God is infinite. God is so beyond us. The one thing that I've learned the more I've learned is how little I know, how very little any of us can really know because what we are studying and seeking to understand is the mysterious, inscrutable, ineffable God Almighty. But he loves us, and he is will to reveal himself to us. And so we do the best we can. So remember this definition of faith, to believe in God, to believe everything God has said and revealed to us, and to believe everything Holy Church proposes for our belief. Why should we do that? Because God who reveals is truth himself. He's trustworthy. I trust him, and I'm sure you do too. That's faith. That's beautiful. Embrace it. There are two dimensions of this mystery of faith, and you can't separate them. My brothers and sisters, Please do not fall into the trap of thinking what's important is my faith, but the faith is not of much importance. That is an absurd statement on the face of it. Your faith and the faith are one. Because if you say, I have faith, I say to you, what, what faith? Faith in what? When you say, I have faith, that means you believe. What do you believe? Anything? Everything? No. We believe in a very definite, absolute, and objective body of doctrine. That doctrine, all the words that are in the Bible, all the words that are in the catechism, the fathers, the doctors, the church documents, all those words, they can be distilled into one only word, the eternal word, Jesus, the Christ. That is what we believe. But... What is your concept of Christ the Lord? What is your understanding? Anything you want it to be? No. It is what God has revealed it to be. He said, I am who I am. God is precisely who he is. He is absolute. He is objective. He is truth. Irrespective of the subject perceiving him. I may think God is four persons. I would be wrong. And I can think that all I want. It won't change God one bit. God is one God, three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so I want to know the true God. How do I do that? By listening to his church, by believing everything Holy Church proposes for our belief. So there are two dimensions to faith. The subjective, that's, that's me, that's you. What our mind is perceiving, when I say I believe, what do I subjectively believe? I believe 
what we believe, what the church believes, what Christ taught to his apostles, and what they handed on to their successors, the bishops, in union with the successor of Peter throughout the ages. That's what I believe. I believe what we believe. And I'll tell you something, we don't make it up as we go along. It's something we've received. It is a sacred deposit, a pearl of great price, and it is not subject to be changed at every women fancy of a passing age in history, no. It is the same in its essence, yesterday, today, and forever. Why? Because it is the truth. Why is our faith the truth? Because our faith equals God. That's what our faith is in, God. And God is immutable. That word means unchangeable. Why is God unchangeable? Because he is perfect. God is absolute perfection. And because of that, he admits of no change. And so the letter to the Hebrews tells us, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. The word of God tells us. So, certain things can change. What things can change? Discipline. Whether we celebrate Mass in Latin or English or French, that can change. Whether we eat meat on Friday or not, that can change. All kinds of disciplinary things can and at times should change. But the essence of the faith, doctrine, morals, that cannot and will not ever change. I'm going to go into this a little bit more. So just understand the difference between the subjective and the objective dimension of faith. I believe, you believe, that's the subjective dimension. That's our faith, your faith, my faith, individually. But what we individually believe is what the church believes. And that's a sacred deposit handed on to us from Christ <clears throat> through the apostles. We believe in this God alone with full assent, the catechism teaches us. I don't give full assent of my intellect and will to any man. But I do give it to God Almighty, who speaks to me through the church. And yes, there are individuals in the church who speak the word of truth, the Holy Father, the bishops, and I accept what comes through them. But what I give my assent to is what they are teaching when it is authentic, when it has come from the apostle, the teaching of Jesus Christ. That's what I give assent to. All right? <clears throat> so make sure you understand that. Full assent is given to God alone. We believe in that God with our whole heart, mind, and strength. And for us, Christians, to believe in God is at once one with believing in his only son, Jesus Christ, the one that he sent, and the Holy Spirit, the one who reveals Jesus to us, the one who builds us up in holiness, the sanctifier, the soul of the church. So what we believe in, <clears throat> the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father revealed himself to us in the person of the Son. The Father and the Son then sent the Holy Spirit to confirm us in the fullness of this divine revelation. And so I give the full assent of my mind <clears throat> and my will to this revelation of God our Father. The faith has certain characteristics which identify it. First of all, faith is a grace. It's a gift. Have you ever run into that frustrating circumstance, I know you have, of trying to speak with someone, a family member, a friend, who just doesn't get it? They just can't believe. And sometimes we get angry, we get frustrated. Well, don't. Faith is a gift. Faith is a gift. All glory to the giver of the gift. But I'll tell you something, because you have the gift, and because I have the gift, <clears throat> that's no merit of ours. Except for the grace of God, we wouldn't have the gift. And so someone who doesn't have the gift, do not be hard on them. Do not beat their brains out with the truth. Some of us do that, you know. I've been accused of doing that, too. And I have to repent. To any extent that I do that, 
have to repent. The truth is beautiful. The truth is a magnet. The truth is what the human mind is made for. And our intellect cannot rest until it rests in the truth. But you cannot force it on any human being. People have to be left free to willingly accept that truth. And so <clears throat> faith is a gift. That's the first characteristic of it. Who's the giver of the gift? God. What's our proper disposition? Thankfulness. Thankfulness for the gift. And we need to continually pray to God, pray to the Holy Spirit, that our faith can be renewed and built up. We need to pray. We need to sacrifice ourselves. We need to exercise virtue in order to be built up in faith. <clears throat> you know, faith isn't static. Once you have it, you might say, well, I have the faith. It admits of degrees. Your faith can increase. Your faith can decrease. Your zeal for the faith can be greater or lesser. And so we have to strive mightily to increase in our beautiful faith. Faith is also a human act. Yes, it's a gift from God, but it is also a properly human act. Trusting in God and cleaving to the truths he has revealed to us are contrary neither to human freedom nor reason, the Catechism teaches us. In faith, the human intellect and the will cooperate with divine grace, believing is an act of the intellect, assenting to the divine truth by command of the will, which is moved by God through grace. <clears throat> so you see, faith is truly something from God, it's a grace, but it is also a human act, a proper human act. It's the co cooperation of God and man. So there's merit involved in it. Yes, first of all, it's a gift. Grace precedes everything. St. Paul says everything is grace. And if you've been given the gift, then how can you boast that it's your own if you've been given it? All you can be is thankful. And so we are. <clears throat> Another characteristic of faith I've alluded to already Faith and understanding. Faith is certain. Faith is the most certain thing in the universe. If I were to learn physics or biology or chemistry, these natural sciences involve truth. God created the universe. The creator, who is truth itself, created the universe out of the fullness of his own wisdom and goodness. So everything that we find in the universe through science, authentic science, by the way, science which is true to its own principle, that is true. And it is never opposed to the faith, because there is no contradiction in the one truth. What part has the darkness in the light? Scripture tells us. <clears throat> Sometimes there are apparent contradictions. Sometimes we have what we call paradox. Our finite mind seems to think that it has found a contradiction in the faith. Things that come to mind, you know, the theory of evolution. How do you square that with creation through a single set of parents? That seems like a contradiction. <clears throat> it's not. The problem is not the faith, it's our mind. Science has not yet worked that out, but science should work on that and continue to strive to enter into the truth. But I tell you, when it's all worked out and the dust settles, you will find that there wasn't the slightest bit of contradiction between the truth found in science and the truth found in our faith. The faith is a higher level of truth. Why? Because God revealed it to us directly. There might be an error in thinking in this or that postulate or hypothesis in empirical science, but you can bet that there's not a single error nor shadow of error in any definitive part of the faith or morals. I believe that. I would not die for the truth of one of Einstein's formulas. Even though he was brilliant, even though it's probably very much true, I am not ready <clears throat> to lay down my life for the theory of relativity. 
or much less for the theory, the hypothesis of evolution. I won't lay my life down for that, but I'm going to tell you something in an instant. I'll lay my life down for the fact that there's one God and three divine persons, the fact that Jesus Christ is really, truly, and substantially present in the Blessed Sacrament. I would lay down my life for the fact that Mary is a virgin before, during, and after the birth of her only son. She is immaculately conceived in an instant, in an instant. I would lay down my life for that. And I know you would too. That is faith. Faith is a higher order of knowledge. But it doesn't mean that the lower order of knowledge is not also true. There is no contradiction between faith and reason. There is no contradiction between faith and authentic science. Faith and freedom. A person has to come to the faith freely. You cannot coerce someone to come to the faith. To come to the faith is to come to love, because love is God, and the faith in its essence is God, too. Now, who in here would be so ridiculous as to hire a hitman to make somebody love you? <laughs> Wouldn't be love. What kind of love would that be? <clears throat> I'm in love with someone, so let me go, go out and get Bruno, the liquidator, to make them love me. Ridiculous. Well, that's the way it is with God. He wants us to love him freely. He wants us to come to the faith freely, the freedom of faith. To be human, man's response to God by faith must be free. Therefore, no one is to be coerced into accepting the faith against his will. Now, the Second Vatican Council taught that very clearly in its document on religious freedom, and the Code of Canon Law teaches it, and common sense teaches it too. And so, what is our attitude to be? <clears throat> Look, we want to have zeal for the propagation of the faith. I want my Father's kingdom to spread on earth. I want everyone to accept the faith, but I cannot impose it on anyone. All I can do is where God gives me the opportunity and a forum to preach or to teach or to live the faith, I just do that. And if they are disposed, they receive it. It's an old axiom in metaphysics. Things are received according to the mode of the receiver. In other words, a person gets what they're ready to get. You cannot jam it down their throat. And you know, you and I may have been guilty of that once or twice in our time. I don't know about you, but I know I can get frustrated. I'm learning in my old age. I am learning. But I'll tell you, God is the one who brings someone to faith. And so I find that I pray more and talk less the older I get, because it's through the power of grace, through the power of prayer, that minds are open to the truth and hearts are open to God's love. And so be a great person of prayer if you would be a great teacher of the faith. For through that prayer, by entering into union with the Trinity, what will happen is you will then have grace going before you like an army, and that grace will work for you. That grace will open the hearts and minds of those that you would touch and bring to the faith. What happens in the hidden order of grace is much more important than what happens in the public arena and the external order of preaching and teaching and catechesis. You see, there's a real relationship between prayer and catechesis. To the degree you are a person of authentic prayer, to that degree, you will be a person who is able to impart the faith to others, a very important principle. Faith is at once personal and communal. Now, <clears throat> many of us Americans, rugged individualists as we are, kind of have this sense that our faith is the faith of a rugged individualist, someone who's set apart. Now, just leave me alone. Let me go to God my way and don't mess with me. 
That's not the way it is. Faith is personal, yes. We do have an individual personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but it takes place in the community of the church. I receive my faith through the church. My faith is in God. My faith is in everything God has said and revealed. Yes, I believe all that Holy Church proposes for my belief. But I'll tell you, all that came to me through the church, through the Catholic Church. You see, the faith of the church precedes the faith of any individual. We receive our faith at baptism. If you're an infant, like I was when I was baptized, <clears throat> I didn't have the use of reason at 10 days of age. I didn't have free will. So where did the faith come? Baptism involves a profession of faith. Where did it come from? came from the faith of the community. It came from the faith of my parents and godparents. It came from the faith of the church. And so this business about just being an individualist and the church, leave me alone in my corner. Listen, there's a place for that. There's a place for going to God alone, to go into your room, as Scripture says, and to pray to God, to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship. But it all takes place in the environment of the church. So faith is at once personal and communal. <clears throat> and those two are not mutually exclusive. You must have both or you run the risk of losing both. Very important. Faith is at once personal and communal. <clears throat> faith has a language. There is a specific language for faith. We do not believe in mere formulas, but in those realities which the formulas express. The formulas are important, though. The formulas convey the underlying realities to us. Words are important, but what is more important are the truths which those words convey to us. Words <clears throat> such as transubstantiation, that word that the church has used for the changing of the substance of bread and wine <clears throat> into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. That word is important, but it's not as important as the underlying reality which it seeks to convey to us. We have not come up with a better word to convey that reality. Our faith isn't in the mere formula. Our faith is in the realities that give rise to the formulas and support them. So faith has a language, and we don't want to mess too much with that language. <clears throat> you see what happens is, if you start playing games with words, you start giving perfectly traditional significations, new twists, you know, for centuries, certain words had a certain meaning in the church. But if you then take those words and give them a twist and a spin that results in a different meaning than what's been passed on, you <clears throat> run a very grave risk of not just messing with language, but messing with the faith. So words are important. Those words convey underlying reality. St. Thomas Aquinas taught this very clearly. The church, which is called the pillar and the bulwark of faith, of truth, faithfully guards the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. And so it is the church's business to safeguard and better present the faith, the truth, the deposit of faith. Many people don't know it. <clears throat> Many of you know it. You've heard it several times since last, when I started last month. The reason Pope John XXIII convened the Second Vatican Council was that the sacred deposit of the doctrine of the faith might be better guarded and taught. He wanted to safeguard and better teach the doctrine of the faith. That's the reason why the council was called. It wasn't called to open the windows, although that was a good side effect of it. It was called 
that the doctrine of the faith might be safeguarded and better taught. Better taught to who? To the men and women of today. That unchangeable truth presented in a way that we can understand as people of the 20th century. That's why the council was taught. And this catechism is the catechism of the Second Vatican Council. It came out of the council. It is filled with references to the Second Vatican Council. And that's a very important point. Through these centuries and so many languages and cultures, this unchangeable faith has been presented faithfully. My brothers and sisters, you and I have been given a great responsibility before God. We've been given a gift, the gift of faith, but with every gift comes a commensurate responsibility. We, like all of the saints, have been charged with the responsibility of handing on in an undiminished, non-impoverished, not distorted form the sacred deposit of the doctrine of the faith. The letter to the Hebrews is a great letter on faith. And I'm going to conclude by reading to you from the 11th chapter, verse 32 and following. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, and forth justice received promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept relief that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and scourging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of animals, destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering over the face of the earth and dwelling in dens and caves. Faith is a gift. Many have gone before us. That faith is truth. That faith is unchangeable in its essence. That faith will build us up. That faith will set us free because it is the truth. That faith, that gift of God, is something we must love, something we must allow to transform us into what our faith is all about, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. May the good God fill you with this gift of faith, and may you impart it to all the church and through the church to all the world. God bless.